Unfortunately, some writers, fearing that they're too close to their own difficult stories and that they must somehow maintain some emotional distance, may create a narrative stance that goes too far in the other direction. A too distant point of view, a kind of godlike omniscience that makes empathy almost impossible. In an article I wrote a few years back, I called this approach to distance, something that beginning writers do all the time, the attack of the 50-foot narrator. Rather than using either an intimate first-person narrator or a close third-person narrator, the writer may create a distant narrative voice that observes and passes judgment on everyone in the story. The resulting point of view, like a bird's-eye camera angle from high above, which inadvertently keeps the writer, he thinks, at a safe distance from events, perhaps, but prevents us from being able to feel much of anything for the people he's writing about. Because perceptive others can sometimes see our most difficult unresolved issues almost immediately, we must rely on others at times to tell us what they understand about us that we can't see ourselves. A writing workshop that's empathetic, respectful, and honest can serve that purpose perhaps better than anything I know. While those who write the journalistic essay must often write with greater narrative distance than those who write the personal essay, the most successful journalistic essays often have a clear third or first-person narrator with a distinctive voice and vision, an observer who ultimately will be changed by the story she reports even if that change remains implied rather than stated outright. There may be, in other words, a kind of intimacy even in the most objective journalistic essay, and that intimacy can actually make such an essay more compelling. Certainly, like the most distinguished professional straight or hard news journalists striving after the factual truth about public events, or, if they're investigative journalists, events that very soon will become public, the best creative nonfictures writing about private events are bound by the same journalistic ethics, or at least, as many argue, perhaps they should be. For the journalistic essay, one must maintain a kind of journalistic and scientific integrity, relying on credible, well-documented sources, both primary and secondary, spending time interviewing those who might have different points of view of the same events, either public or private, emotional or political, using narratives and other examples, valid statistical and other factual evidence from legitimate journals, books, newspapers, or respected scientific articles and well-sourced web links on the Internet. Creative nonfiction writers writing the personal essay, some might argue, must meet even higher standards of integrity and authenticity than those in the journalistic profession. At the very least, they must commit to greater artistic integrity, with an eye toward a greater sense of craft than, say, a newspaper article written on a daily deadline. That doesn't mean that creative nonfiction is somehow superior to news writing, only that creative nonfiction writers focus on using many of the same literary techniques that contemporary poets and fiction writers use to create strong lyrical and narrative authority, sometimes experimenting with and pushing the boundaries of form to say something, if possible, in a new way. For the personal essay or memoir, one must maintain artistic integrity, not just relying on the overly abstract language of emotion or analysis, but instead on the elements of literary craft and the techniques of fiction and poetry, writing compelling narratives with a distinctive voice and vivid, effective dramatization, characterization, and dialogue using prosaic language that emphasizes precision and elegant simplicity, and lyrical language that emphasizes moments of insight and recognition, as well as using vivid images, surprising details that act as literary proofs, some remembered, some imagined, and metaphors, what T.S. Eliot called objective correlatives, to carry significant meaning and emotion. Finally, writers of creative nonfiction must also maintain a commitment to intellectual honesty as well as psychological and emotional integrity, to tell not just the factual truths, but truths that reflect a deeper questioning about what it means to be human, what people do to themselves and others, and perhaps why, even if sometimes it's almost impossible to understand. Chekhov wrote in a letter once that writing was for him less about finding the right answers than in asking the right questions. For me, the best creative nonfiction, fiction and poetry, does exactly this, helping us to understand and to feel the implications of what it means to be human, perhaps a bit more clearly, even when we must also continue to live with what poet John Keats called a negative capability, a kind of unsettling and unsettled uncertainty. 
For me, no essay represents better the elements of both the personal and the journalistic essay and this larger sense of unresolved and unresolvable questioning than Joanne Beard's The Fourth State of Matter. Originally published in the June 24, 1996 issue of The New Yorker and reprinted in her remarkable book of essays, The Boys of My Youth, this essay combines public events with a strong adherence to the facts and private events with a strong adherence to emotional truths in a way that's almost seamless, understated, and yes, mostly unresolved and open-ended, revealing both insight and larger truths about the unpredictable and chaotic nature of life, striving less to supply simple answers than to ask the right questions. Beard skillfully uses both intimate third and first-person points of view, shifting from the story of a disaffected and disturbed young Chinese graduate student who eventually shoots and murders several of Beard's co-workers, and her own preoccupations with squirrels living in her attic, her dying incontinent collie, her feckless and noncommittal husband who's recently left her but who still retains a kind of childlike dependence upon her, and the doomed scientist she works with at the University of Iowa. The story's irony remains implicit that somehow her dying dog and her bosses telling her that she can go home the day of the murders eventually leaves her as a survivor, traumatized at a safe distance by what happened and burdened with survivor's guilt. The shift from her own memories in a first-person point of view to a third-person point of view that cobbles together the fact of the murder's life and last days, imaginatively putting herself empathetically into his mind, is so skillfully rendered that most of us who read the essay don't notice the sub subtle shifts in point of view. In this sense, Beard writes her own story without sentimentality or self-pity, while also finding a way to enter into the strange world of a disturbed young man who murders others for almost no reason at all. When we return to the central assertion of this presentation, that creative nonfiction is not just what happened but how it felt, we see how Beard's essay becomes a work of art, maintaining an almost perfect balance of understatement and lyricism, of narrative distance and narrative authority, and of journalistic and artistic integrity, all the while recreating the experience of emotions in an understated and subtle way that remains with the reader for hours, days, even years, as if the reader herself had experienced such a powerful blend of both ordinary and extraordinary events. Are our lives worth writing about? Are our individual stories important? Absolutely. Even and perhaps especially when we don't believe they are. How many times have I had a student come by my office telling me, Sorry, Professor Lex, but I can't turn in my Arnold Schwarzenegger automatic weapons and large explosion-filled post-apocalyptic and hugely derivative zombie and vampire killing story because mi abuelita shot me primo's pit bull last night. Whoa, I say, hold on. Stop right there. Why aren't you writing about your family, your grandmother and your cousin's pit bull instead of all this guff? Ah, that's just my life, students say. My life is boring. Like hell it is, I say. My job as a writer and writing teacher of the last 25 years has most often come down to this. Discovering, often by drawing out stories from my students that embarrass them, my students' authentic stories, until they first acknowledge and then discover themselves what their true stories and voices are. Then I try to help them give permission to themselves to see their own stories not just as vaguely interesting and valid, but often as something remarkable and invaluable for them and for others. Unfortunately, this task is far more difficult for those students who most need to understand their own lives, who remain in a kind of denial and refuse to see that their true authentic selves and voices are almost impossible to discover and develop if they see themselves and their lives as somehow being worthless or boring. To some degree, most of us are wounded or enslaved by our memories and our pasts. And sometimes only through writing can we become complete and authentic human beings. But it takes a kind of unflinching honesty and hard work to do so. The son of a Russian serf, Anton Chekhov, once wrote in a letter to his friend Alexei Suvorin that a writer must squeeze the slave out of himself drop by drop. Writing creative nonfiction, especially the personal essay and memoir, isn't just about telling our stories 
but about finding how we may free ourselves by looking at ourselves unflinchingly with artistic and journalistic integrity, taking ourselves from a place of invisibility, blindness, or even slavery to a place from which we may see ourselves clearly perhaps for the first time, a place of self-discovery and freedom. <laughs>